Okay, good evening, everybody. Uh, this is June 6, 2018. It is the first day of the City Council's budget hearings that we are holding as we're required to do uh, by our City Charter. Um, I'll ask first if there's any public comment before we begin, and there does not seem to be. Um, so we will um, start by uh, having a roll of the council. Oh, you're all the way over there. Here. Present. Here. Councillor Lebarge. Present. Councillor Murphy. Here. Councillor Nash. Here. Councillor O'Donnell. Here. Here. Okay, so we have a quorum and we have convened. I'll note, because I have to, that these meeting that these proceedings are being audio and video recorded. And um, the first and really only item of, of business on our agenda is to open a public hearing on the fiscal FY. Uh, the fiscal year 19 city budget. So do I hear a motion to open a hearing? Move to open the hearing. Second. Okay. All those in favor of open the hearing say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, the hearing is open. And what what we're gonna do is we have about we have five city departments who will be coming before us to discuss their budgets. Um, it will be uh, in order for counselors to ask questions about the information they hear and it also be in order for members of the public if they show up during these hearings um, to be recognized and ask their own questions about the budget. I'll say at the outset that our plan is to continue this public hearing from tonight to tomorrow night which will coincide with the beginning of the regular city council meeting at seven o'clock in the city council chambers. And that will be an additional opportunity for members of the public to come and uh, comment on the budget at that time if they wish, but we're starting tonight. Um, so I will ask, if I might, um, I would ask Director Donna Lascalia, who is our director of the Department of Public Works, uh, to step up and be the first city department to present on the budget. And the floor is yours whenever, whenever you're ready. Hi, good evening. So the DPW's budget reflects the scale and the scope of the services that the department provides. Um, we manage the engineering, parks and cemeteries, highways, equipment repair, and all utility operations within the city. And that's water, sewer, stormwater, and solid waste. Um, so what I'll do is I'll just kind of uh, run through by division and hit the high points and just feel free to ask questions while I'm doing so. Um, so the, the first division we have is administration and engineering. And um, this year we have combined these two divisions budgets um, just for simplicity more than anything. Um, the biggest thing I'd like to say about this is, is I, I'm pleased to say we're at full staffing levels. And so what does that mean exactly in administration and engineering? Um, this is important because of the engineering projects that we're managing. So we have nine members of our engineering staff, um, including someone who's completely dedicated to watershed operations, um, someone who has advanced mapping capabilities and sort of maintains our GIS system. Um, some engineering positions are partially funded through the enterprise funds and some are funded Three of those nine members of, of the engineering department are registered Massachusetts professional engineers. Um, so we have quite a bit of skill and experience in the department and we are managing, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in infrastructure as well as tens of millions in active projects right now. Um, so moving on to the highway division, 
Um, the DPW has the ability to in-house repair and maintain our fleet of highly specialized vehicles and equipment, and this includes enterprise vehicles. Um, we have very specialized equipment that maintains our utility lines, um, and, and we have a team of mechanics who are employed and stationed at the DPW. Um, we also repair and maintain over 150 miles of roadway. Um, I also want to call out the city's commitment to uh, trees, uh, tree planting and maintenance, uh, line item in here for $50,000 to support the purchase of new trees. Um, and we also have a dedicated tree crew that, that works out of Locust Street um, that trims, uh, removes, and plants new trees. Um, then we move along to the Parks and Cemeteries Division, and again, just like the administration and engineering, we have combined in the budget these two divisions just for, for sort of, um, I guess I would say consistency, but it's, it's also ease. Um, with this division is maintaining 80 acres of recreational fields and, and four, as well as four cemeteries. Um, I will also mention that Florence Field is 100% organic, so all organic uh, fertilizers and, and pest control. So then we move along to the water enterprise. We are managing and operating a 6.5 million gallon per day treatment plant, as well as 160 miles of water mains, 1,400 hydrants, associated uh, structures and, and facilities. Um, what you're seeing here, again, is the combination of treatment and distribution operations uh, under one superintendent. Um, I, I will say that the list of personnel is long. The reason for this is because you have folks who are allocated across many divisions. So for example, my salary is paid partially out of the water enterprise and partially out of the sewer enterprise and partially out of the stormwater enterprise. So there's a lot of folks within the department that this applies to. Um, so then we move to the sewer enterprise, and this is capturing the maintenance and operation of a 15 million gallon per day wastewater plant, as well as 110 miles of sanitary sewers, associated structures, facilities, and equipment. Um, I, I will mention that we have a, a dedicated position um, we call it the camera van technician. So we have a, a dedicated position um, where we are able to investigate and catch abnormalities in our source system, hopefully before they become a problem. So we have the capability to actually video our sewer and stormwater lines, um, and that position is in this budget. Um, then we'll move to the solid waste enterprise. Uh, we are operating two transfer stations. We're operating events such as like our hazardous waste collection day as well as other recycling events. We have to haul the trash we collect at the transfer station. So this requires a, a dedicated equipment operator as well as significant engineering and administrative support. The engineering support is uh, for uh, items related to the closure of the landfill. So there's sort of ongoing engineering that's necessary um, for us to stay in compliance. And finally, I'll hit the stormwater and flood control utility. So we are, as everyone knows, maintaining and operating a flood control pump station, two levee systems, as well as 120 miles of storm drains, 5,000 <coughs> catch basins, uh, more than six miles of, of ditches and drainage channels. Um, the, the budget reflects the engineering oversight that's needed to support a, a system of this scope. Um, and, and really all the city's infrastructure is, is quite significant. I've rattled off a whole bunch of statistics here, but there's, there's a lot of engineering, administrative, and operational support that needs to go into what we're doing every day. Any questions? Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, are there questions from the council <laughs> for? Um, Donna, where is the trash brought to? Where do we dispose of it? We're hauling it to Chicopee right now. And at some point, that will no longer be an option and we'll need to haul it somewhere else. I also have noticed in several of, um, several vacancies, the store enterprise, you have a couple, and I think there was five in another department. Have those been filled? Yes, yeah, so this, this budget, 
shows a moment in time. And at the moment in time that the budget was published, those vacancies did exist. So some positions have since been filled, some have not. Uh, some we staffed with uh, temporary summer help. Um, so it's, it's sort of like a, a constantly changing organization. It's a very large organization. So uh, sometimes we do have turnover, uh, but some of these positions have been filled. Thank you. Our Councilor Klein. Thank you for this um, report. I'm just looking at some of the different departments and I see that um, several of them have fairly significant increases and I'm just wondering if you can speak generally about what those increases might be, the Parks and Cemetery Division, um, or a couple of them. And it's, you know, not a huge um, increase. I think the it's 11,000 in parks and cemeteries. Um, solid waste is 40,000 more. So uh, I don't expect specifics here, but I'm just wondering if you can speak a little bit to those increases. Sure. Some of the increases that you're seeing, like in parks and cemetery, for example, um, we do have contractual obligations to our employees. So all of the employees that are in parks and cemetery are represented by name. Um, and we have contractual obligations to them to give them step raises um, as well as certain percentages every year, as you know. Um, in this particular case, we have also uh, stayed stable with our staffing levels. So we have stayed um, you know, with FY18 staffing numbers, so you can see that reflected in here. Um, what I have tried to do is we have sort of personnel shifting or adding just and this is sort of big picture is I've tried to see where we can save an OM so that we can really do a level funded budget kind of overall and that's just big picture across all divisions if I if I may on that same subject I know two large decreases um, in the water enterprise and sewer enterprise and I wonder if you could kind of elucidate that about Half a million dollars each, or give or take? Yeah, a lot of this is, um, I'll talk about sewer first. So at the wastewater treatment plant, we had been budgeting for electricity at a very high level, um, or a very high number, if you will. And you know, over time, we've engaged in process improvement. We've engaged in sort of energy saving measures. So we were able to take a pretty good chunk out of that number. Um, we also, and, and <coughs> as another good example of this, uh, chemicals, you know, the, the, what we need to do to treat the water, what we need to do to treat the wastewater. So this really applies to your water and sewer enterprises. We find as we make process improvements or replace equipment, we need less chemicals. We also need less manpower, you know, there's as, as we systematize things and, and uh, have the ability to sort of remotely control our operation, uh, you can decrease your overtime, you can decrease your call-ins, and of course that all represents a saving. So that's just sort of, um, you know, big picture across both utilities. Great, and as we contemplate and, and undertake many uh, improvements, uh, capital improvements to the wastewater treatment plant, are you kind of factoring in um, or anticipating or maybe just hoping and reserving for the future so you can come out with savings later. But ongoing savings that come from um, improving the actual facility, because that's a lot of it, isn't it? You're going to be replacing um, the chemical processes and the granulated carbon uh, filtering system and, and the other kind of mechanisms that maybe actually lead to ongoing operational savings. Is that, is that fair to say or is that too? That is correct. What's in the budget is what we anticipate we will spend this year. So I, I'm, I'm not uh, counting our savings until we actually see them occurring. But it is fair to say that the equipment and process improvement that we're going to be undertaking will continue will continue to be reflected in future budgets. Right, because that will be a, a multi-year process on the, on the wastewater treatment plan. Thank any other comments or questions, Councilor Bidwell? Um, sure. Thanks. Thanks for the very complete uh, presentation here. Um, on on uh, paving, you and I've emailed about this, and there will be opportunities to discuss this on, on another day. But I, I just I just note at a very superficial level, um, the miles 
just looking at, at, at this last year, the miles paved in relation to 150 miles is under, is like 1.6% of our total paved miles worth. And so at, at that rate, we'd get to everything in 66 years. I know that's a very simplistic and superficial, but nevertheless, that, that kind of jumps out. And on a, from, a, from a personnel point of view, setting aside the capital expenditures aspect of it, from a personnel point of view, uh, is, there, is there capacity to increase the attention to, uh, to, to, to the paving program if the dollars on the equipment side and were, were there? Paving is something we contract out. So if we're, if we're going to reconstruct or, or reclaim a road, it's something that is contracted out. We, that is something that would be handled not by the highway division, but by the engineering division. So do we have internal capacity to manage that? Yes, we do. So it's just a question of the dollars for the actual work, the actual contract, the actual, the actual supplies. Yeah, and there's certainly permitting and design that goes into any sort of reconstruction project, and many of our roads need uh, massive uh, the infrastructure work and there is time and permitting associated with that. Okay. Any other questions about the DPW's operating budget? Okay. Thank you very much, Director Scalia. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Um, we'd like to invite Superintendent Provost to present next, if I might. <coughs> <coughs> And for members of the public, we'll find the appropriate time for you to stand up and weigh in on any of these subjects as, as well. So, but for now, you have the floor. Thank you, and thank you for accommodating me um, so that I can hear my wonderful middle school band play at the Academy of Music tonight. <laughs> Sorry I missed the part about being at JFK. Uh, but uh, thank you for getting me on early anyways. Uh, so as you know, I come forward with a $29.7 million school budget request, which is a 3% increase from the prior year. Um, the, some of the, the priorities within the school budget are increasing social emotional supports for students. Um, you may have heard or read in the newspaper that um, the population of Northampton public schools is changing and that we are um, we, we're educating students who come to us increasingly with trauma experiences, and um, those can be very disruptive in a school setting and providing sufficient capacity in order to help students um, address those needs and still learn um, was an important goal of this budget. And so many of the positions that were added um, within this budget are in the domain of social and emotional support, most specifically school psychologists and board certified behavior analysts. Also, um, we made significant increases to our ESL program. We have had a growing population of English language learners in the schools for several years and frankly have been understaffed in that department for um, the entire time I've been here and probably long before that. It was a goal of ours to um, continue to make adjustments to the annual budget process, but we were never really able to keep up with the increases we were seeing. We were pretty much keeping our understaffing level, or our, our, our capacity gap, if you will, even, because as we added more staff, we got more students. Um, this year, we had um, a significant, uh, infusion on top of sort of the natural increases we were seeing due to relocation of students from Hurricane Maria and um, really the beginning of our refugee resettlement program. So after social emotional supports, the next area where we uh, made investments in this year's budget was the ESL program. We started the budget process as we always do in December. We added two new pieces of the budget process this year in order to increase community engagement and transparency. First was issuing a survey to our school community about things that they identified as priorities within the school budget. We had 283 responses and we had it broken into two areas. First was in core academics and then non-academic areas. So in core academics, the um, the two identified priorities among the respondents was hiring more core academic teachers and reducing class size. We um, do believe we've been able to 
achieve that at the elementary level with this budget would be a small decrease but to some very reasonable sizes um, we think the elementary class size will probably reduce from 19 to 18 and that is uh, a very favorable class size compared to our nearby neighbors in the non academic area of the survey three things came out increasing student services so the two things that I mentioned that were um, priorities in the budget increasing social emotional supports and increasing ESL services both fall within the student services domain next was increasing the arts we really weren't able to do a lot with that but I'm happy to say that we were able to at least go from a part-time band teacher to a full-time band teacher at the high school this year and the third area was technology um, which we are making significant advances in thanks um, in no small part to the capital improvement plan and purchase of Chromebooks that the uh, council makes possible so thank you for that um, I know you have the the budget materials in front of you so I just wanted to point out a couple of things the first is the budget summary with special education included in the site budgets it's a pie chart it's about four pages in it's the second pie chart and this shows the portion of the district budget that's included in each of the cost centers I think this was a very important chart to get into the budget this year because one of the concerns um, that was voiced in the community early on in the year was whether there was parity in provision of supports among the different schools and so that's really most significant at the elementary level because you have four elementary schools there's only one middle school there's only one high school and so you can see um, Bridge Street Elementary has 8.2 percent of the budget Jackson Street has 8.1 percent of the budget Leeds has 7.8 percent and Ryan Road has 6.6 percent Ryan Road significantly smaller than the other three elementary schools so I just wanted to point that out I'd also talk about another piece that we added to the budget process this year which was a district-wide school council joint meeting to review the budget so all six councils which normally meet individually because they're responsible with um, helping the principal with the programming at their own school and, and making budget recommendations with their own school um, we felt it was important to bring them all together so that they could all see the whole budget um, and I think that was an important part of the healing process this year and I think this um, this particular chart was very important for the school councils to see also um, Desi is going to be uh, requiring us to report differently in the future um, including the special education costs within the cost centers and so this takes a step towards that and gets us really ready for that um, change uh, the next piece I draw your attention to is two pages on it's the Northampton public schools FY19 school budget department our school department budget and it shows the major budget areas these are DESI reporting categories just a few things to point out here um, one is utilities is decreasing for us um, that is due to the city's investment in solar which the schools have benefited from and so I want to thank you for your foresight on that uh, it really was one of the things that was saving our bacon this year um, we were especially at Bridge Street School over extended but um, we felt comfortable making some investments that were beyond the budget because we felt that solar savings would come in and um, help us and it in fact did this year and to such an extent that we feel comfortable reducing utilities in the next year's budget also um, the, there's a new transportation contract so you'll notice that that is up um, I think we had a very successful transportation contract we had four bidders which is really unusual to get um, regardless of the size of your district and there was only an $893 difference in the two lowest bids um, on a $5 million bid, which means the bid specs were written really well. So I want to thank Candy for that. Um, so uh, the, the last thing that I would just point out before, we, before I take questions is that 
much like the city's overall budget, this was the first year that we dipped into reserves um, in order to make this budget work. So we are spending $166,000 of school department reserves in order to make this budget balance. Our projections right now are that we run out of money in 2022. Um, there's fair share amendment and there are other things that might um, extend that timeline or change that trajectory, but that's what it looks like for us right now. Thank you very much. Um, other questions? Councilor Scherer. Uh, first, <clears throat> I want to thank you for your um, your budget letter. I appreciated the, the message and um, the emphasis on healing sort of on multiple levels. So uh, thank you for that. Um, also, I see that Bridge Street has a significant increase both in funds and also personnel. Um, <clears throat> Thank you for that as well. And um, do you can you talk a little bit about how you think this is going to um, help with the continued implementation of the new inclusion model? So <coughs> one of the things that I want to say about that is I think it's important to take a historical perspective on this because I was actually preparing for the June school committee meeting, and one of the things that we said that we would look at. Um, as part of a measure of the implementation were the workers' comp claims because part of the concern was about was the change creating a more chaotic environment, a less safe environment for students and teachers. And um, surprisingly, in the last 24 months, the most um, conflict-ridden time at Bridge Street School was about a year ago. There were seven workers comp claims in May there were four worker comp claims in June um, based on student aggression to staff the best 90-day um, period in that two-year time frame is the 90 days we're in right now there was I think maybe three claims in January one in March and no other claims in the whole second half of the year so that's as a way of saying I think that the rollout certainly had problems. Um, I was there all the time. I was there 36 days this year, um, so I don't deny any of that. But I think that a significant corner was turned about the first of the year, and I think that uh, Bridge Street is well on its way. So what will the new, the new resources do? Um, it really provides Bridge Street with an opportunity to sort of hit the reset button on its social emotional supports for students. They're getting a brand new school psychologist and a full time school psychologist. They're getting a brand new BCBA and a BCBA that's building based instead of a contract service. So I think, and, and I've had the opportunity to bring them in um, as part of the hiring process. So I know that they're going to be a strong team for each other and a strong support for the teachers and will work well with the administration of the building. So I think that um, just having that kind of leadership from the uh, what I'll call the social emotional domain I think will be the the strongest um, the, the strongest change we're making at bridge um, because I think this is really the challenge there you know one of the things that um, I've explained to the school committee and I'll just explain to you is that up to a quarter of the students in Massachusetts schools isn't talking about Bridge Street in particular but up to a quarter of the students in Massachusetts school now have some kind of diagnosable mental illness which means that when a teacher gives an instruction a quarter of the kids may do something that you're not expecting them to do right and so having teachers be able to have the lens of what it's like to be the student who has the unusual reaction um, is really the change because we all know, as a teacher, I know what it's like when you expect something to happen and it doesn't, or you get the opposite of what you expected. Um, you can easily sort of go to the place of your own professionalism. What am I doing wrong? Am I in control? You know, et cetera, et cetera. All that is wrong. Um, what you need to do is go to the student's perspective and say, what's happening for the student that's making him or her act this way? And I think having a BCBA and a school psychologist full time in Bridge Street will um, be able to form stronger relationships with the students so they can get some insights into that and to share that information with the teachers. Other questions from the council but the school department? <coughs> Councilman. 
So, as the, the Ward 3 counselor, I've heard a lot about Bridge Street School. So do you think, uh, Superintendent, that we, that this budget adequately addresses the concerns uh, and, and that we have a plan in place as we move forward um, around the concerns at Bridge Street School? Absolutely. Thank you. Other questions from the council? Well, I would just note, I thank you for your, the excellent job you and, and many others have done on your budget. I think everyone recognizes that um, you, you're doing a, a, an outstanding job despite the fact that there's much you can't control. Uh, if you read the mayor's uh, budget message in this document, you'll note that um, the charter school question, um, the amount that uh, the city of Northampton is being shortchanged just in the reimbursement part of what charter schools cost the district was at least $200,000 or something like that. And you just noted the amount of money that, that the school department, or the school public school district is withdrawing from the stability fund, its share, is less than that. So I mean, it's a striking juxtaposition, I think, the fact that a, a broken system, a broken funding formula under which our school, our school district and you um, labor um, from one perspective, you know, if, if, it were, if it were different, we perhaps would not be withdrawing money from the stability fund. We would be in a much better, a much better place. And um, so I'm, I'm grateful that despite those frustrations, um, you continue to move forward and, and you've put together uh, a very strong budget on, on many different fronts. So, so thank you very much. Councilor Pibble. Um, on, on that same topic, uh, I know there's not an easy answer to this, but my, my, my question is, what, what more can we do as a, as a city council to address this uh, fatally flawed funding formula for the charter schools? Yes, we can pass a resolution from time to time if there should ever be another ballot measure that says, no, we don't think there should be any expansion of, of charter schools in the Commonwealth, and we don't think there should be uh, any expansion of the Chinese Immersion Charter School. So we can we can pass resolutions. What 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 more would you say that we could do as a as a as, as a city council on this very critical issue? Because I I see the same numbers as everybody else does. This enormous drain that we have going out to charter schools. I think the problem really is the reimbursement formula. Um, so as I look at one of the latest spreadsheets that came out from the Department of Education. It looks like they're projecting one more student going to charter schools next year as compared to this year. I think the number goes from 198 to 199. And the cost to Northampton goes up $200,000. Obviously, that's not the cost associated with that student. That's the cost associated with the funding formula not working. Um, which is a, a formula that's outside of the, any municipality's ability to control. So what can you do about that? I mean, I will definitely advocate for this in, in spite of the fact that we have a very good budget and have had stability that many of our neighboring districts are jealous of. It's still hard. You know, 3% is basically paying for raises. It's four and a half percent between the steps. It's one and a half percent or one and a quarter, whatever it was, COLA. So most of what we've been able to do in the budget, we've been able to do by um, re reallocating resources. So um, one, of the, one of the committee members says sometimes it feels like you tear down your shed to build a barn and then you build down your barn to build a hay rack. And there's a, there's a, there is an element of that in it. So I think more resources um, could help with en encouraging more families to stay within the, the, the district. Um, as someone who goes and visits schools across the Commonwealth, I can say there are some savage inequalities, right? You know, um, you go to some of the districts right outside of Boston, um, they have people waiting to, you know, sanitize the, the door handles after you walk through the door. That's so far from where we are. You know, and, you know, the, the changes in technology or the, the disparities in technology. So I would say, you know, within your control, what can you do? 
more funding. Because, you know, I promise you, if we were able to have more than 3%, we would use it wisely, and we would use it to strengthen this district. Any other comments from the council or questions? So, Mr. Superintendent, thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Um, we've gone through two presentations. At this time, I'd ask if there are members of the public who would like to comment. I would invite comment on either the, um, or on any subject, really, but I would encourage comment on the DPW or the schools. Yes, sir. Feel free, feel free to come up to the podium, if you would. And if you would please give your name and address for the record. And uh, before I say anything, I just, oh, 30 North Maple, if that makes any difference, right here in Florence. Uh, I come to this building every day because I go swimming in the great swimming pool that we have here. It's a great resource. And the staff and everybody else is amazing. And I, I say I come every day to go swimming. So. That's just, but that was not part of my remarks. These are my remarks, okay? About these, about the, I guess, the DPW. Since the warm days of February and the emergence of thousands of potholes, I wondered how it is that the roads and sidewalks have been allowed to deteriorate. It has taken decades of neglect to create the worst roads in the valley in our town with the highest tax rate and the biggest budget. Previous administrations, as well as the current one, have determined that safe roads and sidewalks are a low priority. Here at the school, where we want our children to feel safe, there are over 50 potholes. We say we support the handicap, yet for somebody with a cane and a walker, the sidewalks are like a minefield. Early in the spring, an excuse offered for the unfilled potholes was that the cold weather had delayed the asphalt plants from starting up. There was a time in the memory of some of us when the city had a schedule for resurfacing all of our roads. The cycle took about 10 years. Now, on a very limited budget, and you know how limited it is, the DPW tries to glue the roads together and fill up the most obvious potholes. Recently, our mayor has touted the prospect of the marijuana tax helping fix the roads. When I read the article, I thought the headline should have read, Potheads to Fill Potholes. That notwithstanding, I believe there is a proposal to bond the repair of the roads, that is, tax the residents of Northampton for decades, what is normally called an operating expense. My mother used to say that she never charged her food or her furniture. She got the money and she stayed current. About 80 miles from here and 150 years ago, Henry David Thoreau counseled that we should live within our means. We do not. We buy things we don't need at the expense of the infrastructure. We wear out our cars and we elevate our anxiety every time we drive. About 50 years ago, there was only one restaurant the Wiggins Tavern, and no place to get coffee. A Sears Cadillac store was where the Florence Bank is now. <clears throat> Empty storefronts were below boarded up upper floors. But fortunately for us, there were a number of energetic and ambitious individuals who were encouraged by enlightened city policies we can't go back to those good old days, but we can return to the times before them by driving on our dilapidated roads. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there other members of the public who would like to speak? Okay, if not, then I suggest that we move um, 
to the North End Police Department. I'd, I'd invite Chief Jody Casper to join us at the podium. <coughs> Welcome, thank you for your time. And thank you for having me. The floor is yours. All right, so you, you all have the budget in front of you. I don't have too much to say about it because it's relatively unchanged. Uh, on the personnel side right now, I'll tell you, we currently have three police officer vacancies uh, on this right now. Uh, we also, in addition to that, have three in the current police academy. They're scheduled to graduate in August. They'll be on the street in January. So we're actually on the street visibly short uh, six officers right now. We anticipate losing quite a, quite a lot next year in this upcoming fiscal year. Uh, the Mass State Police are putting another class through, which always takes from our staff because our staff is so great. They love hiring our officers, which is good for them, uh, tough for our city in the training costs. We burn out a lot of our field training officers, and it's a high expense for our city whenever we have to train anyone. So we're anticipating that this year coming up uh, as we move into the next fiscal year. Uh, the only change on the personnel side is really the, the reflections and contract changes and then also the crossing guard rate uh, went from 12 to $13. So that hadn't been changed in about a decade. That actually is a position that we struggle to fill. Uh, Jackson Street School was one of the positions we had a lot of problems filling this year. And when we can't fill that position, we end up using a police officer to fill it. That's uh, we only have so many, we only have four cars on the street uh, at minimum staffing. So using one for an hour to cover a crossing guard detail is uh, maybe not the best use of our resources. So we're hoping to be able to keep those filled. Uh, and so you see that increase there of 3,600 for the crossing guards. Uh, on the operations side, uh, you may notice a big jump, but really the uh, uniform allowance for police officers, which is just around $57,000, that used to be on the personnel side, and it was moved to the operations side. So it's not an increase in our total uh, budget, but it just moved to a different location, so you may have noticed that. Um, in the operations budget, I did move some money around to better reflect where we're spending our money. Uh, for vehicles and repair, for instance, we've gone over that for the last three years. So I moved money from a line where we haven't been going over, like fuel, we've been doing okay, although I know fuel prices are on the increase right now. We'll see what happens as we move into the next year. Uh, but that's an example of one where I move money from one line to another just to more ad accurately reflect you know, what it is that we're actually spending our money on. Training is also something uh, that is uh, an area that we always go over. Uh, communications and equipment, I increased that a little bit. Uh, again, just move that money from a different line. Like telephones, we spend less on phones now, uh, so I move some from the telephone line. So those are just some examples of some uh, small changes to the OM, but the bottom line is still the same. That's everything I have about the budget. I'm sure you have some questions. Are there any questions from the council? And this is all about operating uh, budgets. Do you want to ask a question here? Well, Councilor Nash and then Councilor Klein. And, and actually, I think this is a question for the mayor that I noticed that uh, there's a 7.4% increase in your salary. And um, I just want to ask about that. And it's probably better for the mayor to answer that. Or um, So uh, as some of you know, um, Chief Casper was appointed uh, just about three years ago, um, and at that point, we uh, chief we, we basically have two employees in the city who work under a contract: our fire chief and our and our police chief. Um, so the contract that uh, Chief Casper is currently on expires at the end of this fiscal year, uh, June thirtieth. Um, so we uh, uh, we're looking at renewing her contract. Um, and as part of that process, um, taking a look at a couple of different things, um, both changes to the internal pay structure of the police department, um, because of the collective bargaining agreement changes within the police department itself, you know, we have the patrol officers, we have the um, sergeants and lieutenants, we have captains, then we have the chief. Um, one, of the, one of the goals of the last collective bargaining agreement um, with both of our major bargaining units was to try to maintain separation um, between uh, in salary between those units so that you know the the folks who are in the sergeants 
um, and uh, lieutenants um, that their starting grades, you know, started a certain percentage spread above the um, above the officers. There'd been some drift over time, um, so we did a lot of work around that during the last contract that we're in right now. Um, and so that sort of went through the the process all the way up to the captains. The problem, of course, is that the um, the chief is the only, uh, you know, one of the only unrepresented folks there, um, and so. Um, that those internal uh, differences started running up against the chief in terms of her salary being really close to um, her the next employee the, the the next group below her the captains so we wanted to take a look at that I also wanted to take a look at how um, her salary uh, compared to area communities as well um, and I looked, in fact, at our comparison communities that we use in the budget, um, communities like Chicopee, communities like Holyoke, West Springfield, Amherst, East Hampton, you know, the ones that we use. Um, and, this, and her salary was um, in the lowest sort of quartile uh, among those comparison communities. Um, so for both internal and external equity, I felt it was important to bring that salary up um, both to maintain that separation within um, the organization, um, but also a recognition that we have an outstanding chief of police um, who's done some incredible work in the three years that she's been here. Um, Northampton is a regional leader on so many levels, whether it's the work we're doing as part of the, um, you know, the Hampshire Hope um, initiatives and the DART team, um, uh, her involvement on a number of different regional um, and statewide uh, uh, bodies, the work that we do, do on the regional uh, crime task force, et cetera, um, uh, and also the fact that we have one of the busier, e even for our size, we have one of the busier communities because we are such a destination. So um, the salary that's reflected in the budget um, is part of a contract that I negotiated with the chief, a new three-year contract, um, and so I thought it was important to sort of reset her salary to be reflective of what I think is appropriate for her. And so now, um, not the highest paid chief in Western Mass by any stretch, but instead of being in the lowest quartile, she's in sort of that middle to upper um, quartile, which I think is important. So, um, so that's the explanation for it, and that's why you see that change. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Councilor Klein. So I wanted to just um, check in a little bit more about the $92,000 increase in the operating budget you mentioned a few things certain personnel um, I'm wondering about the overtime piece one of the things that I kind of have looked at is the size of the city and then the size of our department and it appears that we're kind of on the high end for a city of our size we're on the high end in terms of um, how many officers we have um, in the police department and um, a little bit on the high side, I think, for the amount of overtime that we're paying for. So I, I understand that that's part of what that $92,000 increase is, but I'm wondering if you can speak to those two questions, but also give us a little bit more information about that increase and what it actually represents. The increase on the PS or the OM side? On the, the OM side. Okay. So the biggest, the biggest change on the OM side is the money that was moved, the uniform allowance, that 58000 or 57003 I think, that was moved from the PS to the OM. Um, other than that, on the regular OM side, it's the same. So there's, uh, if you see a different increase, I don't see one. So, let me see, maybe I mean the, the can't read with these glasses. It's actually the $72,000 increase on the PS side, too, okay. that I'd love to hear more about. Okay, so the this reflects step raises in the new contract, so it's a lot of step raises. Um, and then we didn't make any other changes other than the crossing guards, which was just 3600 uh, I didn't request any more for overtime, but it's great that you brought it up because we're going to go over this year. We go over every year. Um, one of the challenges of working in this city and having such high demands, not only call volume, where we're over like 40,000 calls a year, but is also the exceptionally high level of service that people want. People want us involved with a lot of preventive work, doing a lot of, you know, reaching, reaching out, going to meetings, going to events that take a lot of time. And our officers are very good about, they're willing to move their hours around and when we ask them to do that. 
um, but we're not always able to do that. Um, and in the other side of that is on the investigative side. When we have, you know, any large case now, it, it just takes so much overtime money. Um, we, we only have six detectives that, you know, take cases. We also have a sergeant and a lieutenant, but our six detectives are completely overtasked. Two of them are working with the drug task force, which is a regional drug task force. We value that because we know that if they make a heroin arrest in Athol, that has a, a, an effect on our community as well. It's coming into this community. We know that. Um, so that's money well spent to, to help address that problem. Um, but we have a really high number of cases that come in and require follow-up. Um, does, does that answer your question? Can you speak to that question, though, of the number of officers that we have in the department compared yep. to cities of similar size? Yeah, I, I mean, I'd have to do, I'd have to look at the number to see where we are with the, with the number. I know that our number has been the same uh, ever since I've been on. I don't believe it's ever gone up or down. We have 65 full-time sworn personnel. Um, and we have some, a small number of special police officers who are previous full-time police officers uh, that either here or somewhere else um, that we use to supplement for overtime and such. Um, the problem is we just can't staff empty positions fast enough. And so that's another problem with overtime that you see reflected as well, you know. I told you right now we're short six on the street. Uh, as well as, in addition, we have other people who have some injuries and that sort of thing. So we're really short on the street right now. We're moving into vacation season. Um, so that also is it's more overtime costs. So you say that the number hasn't changed in several years. The yep. data that I looked at, I think it was from the International Chiefs of Police yep. Association. Um, when you look at the size of Northampton, it does appear that we're definitely on the high side in terms of the size of our force. So mm -hmm. that's, that's really the question that I was trying to get at there. Right, and, and we may be. As I said, I, I can't speak to that. I don't know exactly what the number per 100,000 or per 1,000 number of officers it is. I've seen that number before, but I can't spit it out to you right now. What I can say is that the number 65 is the number that's been the same for 20 years, and our population has remained pretty much the same. Right. So and the data I was looking at was several years old, actually, from this report. So it would, if it's still 65, it probably is quite relevant to the data that I was looking right. at. Right. It's really tricky in Northampton because we have, if you're, if you're just looking at population numbers, uh, we're just such a, a destination city. You know, if we were a bedroom community, we might not need as many, but the reality is 25% of our calls are downtown. That's not where our largest population is necessarily, you know, but we just have a lot of people who come into our community, which makes our community so great, but definitely causes us to have a lot of calls. Thank you. Yep. Oh, yeah. That's right. Good point. The mayor pointed out something. My apologies. I forgot about one thing that we added on here that I didn't have in my notes. Um, so one of the issues that we're having is we have a ton of administrative work to do, and we end up having police officers doing that administrative work, and then our police officers don't get to work the street as much. So examples are some are really small things like getting oil changes for cars. We literally have officers who are driving in cars to get oil changes. It takes an hour of time. Again, when we're looking at our limited resources, we want to make sure that our officers are doing police work and not doing administrative type tasks. Some of the other bigger tasks that our police officers do are things like the accreditation manager job. We, we were the sixth police department in Massachusetts to be accredited. It's really important that we're accredited. It makes our policies and practices the best that they can be. Uh, as the mayor mentioned as well, we're, we're a model in many of the ways that we operate our police department. And to me, that's very important. It was important under Chief Sinkowitz's leadership as well. Um, so that accredi accreditation manager job is a really big job, and it comes in waves. And uh, we just having it, we have it with a patrol sergeant right now. And what happens is then when we have a situation out on the street, we have a domestic or something like that, our policy requires that our that our supervisor respond to that. But if our supervisor's in the station doing this other work, uh, we're not getting the best level of service on the street. Um, so accreditation manager, training management, so that's finding training classes, registering training, doing all the scheduling around training. That's a very administrative job, and I don't know if you in your heads imagine that it's a police officer sitting behind a desk doing that. And, and it was my discussion with the mayor that we could use our resources better if we took jobs like that and assigned it with a civilian who could assist. So there is, that's the money. I think it's 42000 
to have a new civilian, it would be a grants administrator, training coordinator, and accreditation manager. Those are all jobs that are being done by other people right now that are preventing them from actually being on the street. So instead of coming in and saying we need a new police officer and upping that number, I, I don't think that's in our best interest. I think in our best interest is looking at what work people are doing and whether or not that work can be done by a civilian instead of by a police officer. So that reflects that change. Other questions from the council? Councilor Dwight. Uh, it's just a concern, the, the, as we know, there's some upheaval going on in the state police ranks right now, and that would, as you point out, likely mean uh, a, a more robust season of uh, recruiting. Yep. Uh, and, and it's actually fairly well known that, that this police department is uh, very poachable and has been poached frequently. Um, and as you said, we invest we invest the money in the training under an accredited department, which makes them appealing candidates. And you can understand why someone would apply for a state police position, given the, the, the salary difference at the very least. So with that looming, you're six shy now. Mm -hmm. Do you have any sense of, I mean, I'm sure no one, not everyone comes up and tells you that they're considering pulling an application, but would you have a sense how big this is going to be hit on? Five. <laughs> so you do have a rough sense. I have a rough idea, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I can't guarantee that, of course, but that's that's what we're kind of thinking about right now is envisioning that that number may be a loss of five. But that's in addition to the six. Right. So three vacancies, three in the academy, five who may go MSP. The MSP class that is is not <laughs> scheduled right now, and this is what makes it extra challenging for us, is we can't plan for when they're going to go um, because we that there's a lot going on with the state police and their training right now so that academy is not funded um, but my understanding is it's still going to happen so it could happen right now their academy is full with a variety of other recruits not troopers other classes they're running um, but they'll all graduate uh, come September so the academy as a building will be empty and my guess is that we may see some activity there somewhere around there but I it changes all the time. So well, that's going to be a, a challenge for us to put that many people through and to get them trained. It's a, it's a lot. Okay, any other questions from the council? Um, if not, I'd say thank you to our chief of police. Um, I would ask if there are any members of the public who'd like to speak this time. Um, hearing none. I will now invite our uh, Chief of the Fire Rescue Department to join us. Chief, thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank and you for having me. The floor is yours to thank describe you. your department. Uh, I, I bring to you tonight uh, a budget with some slight increases. I think it was a 2.7 increase in there uh, over last year which included the contractual raises uh, for the firefighters and officers in there. Uh, we did increase a few line items. Uh, overtime was one that I increased $20,000. Uh, we haven't increased that line item in four years. And uh, again, as with, with Chief Casper, the challenging thing is personnel. Uh, having people out on long-term injury, uh, FMLA for different matters, uh, and things like that put a big hole into kind of the overtime where we have to fill positions. Uh, I'm thankful right now to say that I'm fully staffed. Uh, I have one person in the academy, and I have no vacancies. So we're, we're doing very well. Uh, this part of the year, since January, uh, we've been really running kind of full staff, and uh, it's really shown, I think, in the overtime. But it was more of a forecast that uh, in the past years, we've run kind of high on kind of the overtime because of filling vacancies that we added that extra money in there just as a buffer because I didn't want to come back uh, to the council late in the year and, and ask for more money on that. Uh, and then the other items was our third party billing. Uh, that's the company that we hire to do all our EMS billing uh, when we transfer patients. Uh, that's partly due to success. Uh, right now, our collection rate for the uh, for our runs are, is running about 60 or 96 percent, uh, where it's basically increased about 2 percent over the last year. So it's, they do it on a percentage base uh, of what they collect. They get uh, basically 2.95 percent of that. Uh, so that basically we're running kind of short on that. We needed to increase it because we're collecting more money uh, for the city. I think our EMS will bring in roughly about $2 million uh, next year uh, for revenue. 
Uh, the other item was EMS equipment. Uh, we increased that about $10,000. Uh, that basically was because of increase in our service contracts. Uh, some of our equipment that we have for EMS uh, specifically, uh, like our automated CPR machines, our <coughs> bulb lead monitors for cardiac issues, uh, basically they increased the slightly, but what it does is it covers everything for the machine. So if we have a breakdown with it, uh, basically it covers it, repairs it, and brings it back to us. Uh, if we had to purchase a new one, uh, the automated CPR machines about $20,000. Uh, a cardiac monitor is running about $35,000. So it's, it's kind of money well spent just to be on the safe side with that. Uh, and, and then the, uh, the last item was uh, emergency management. We always kind of ran a separate emergency management budget and uh, the mayor and I decided that we would just roll it into the fire budget. I think it's about $6,500 uh, where I'm the emergency manager for the city and the assistant fire chief is the emergency manager coordinator. <coughs> it's all been always under the fire budget. We just kind of put it into the, the fire budget where we kind of manage it and oversee it. Um, and, uh, and and as are kind of the changes that we've done to the budget for this coming year. Uh, and again, it used to be listed as a separate department. Yes, it really wasn't a department. It was just showing that sixty five hundred dollars, and it was sort of a, a difference without a distinction. So we just kind of decided to put it in there. So. So it's kind of one of those things that, in, in all honesty, I, I usually never looked at it. If we needed something for emergency management, I, I usually took it out of the fire budget and kind of moved it around that way. So the mayor was gracious enough to, to include it in the budget and, and kind of make it whole. Uh, where really, like I say, the emergency manager for the city is myself and, and the coordinator for it is uh, my assistant chief. Uh, and uh, it just helps kind of with, you know, the emergency management end of that. Uh, other than that, uh, basically, that was really the changes to the budget uh, that we had. Um, I, I would say, is there any questions or? Good question. Are there any questions? Councilor Bart. Um, yes, reading um, for your 2019 budget information, you have made a statement that I'm a little concerned here on the new technology options that you really want to look into about an increase of cancer with firefighters is that happening in your department uh, it, it's we, we haven't seen it we've, we've had recently in the past year one member uh, who passed away because of cancer he was about to retire uh, Bob Davis uh, that was two years ago uh, but as a fire service as a whole across the country they've really done some studies uh, which show that basically firefighters are at an increased risk of cancer because of what we basically do for a job out there uh, one of the initiatives we've done in the department, we're really working with the fire local, uh, is kind of coming up with just, I say, some health and uh, safety initiatives of basically cleaning our gear after fires uh, and making sure, you know, we kind of take care of the people. Uh, but in the service, fire service as a whole, there is an increase in cancer that they've shown uh, because of what we do for a job. Uh, and really that's due in part to the different types of building construction. Uh, if you go back 30, 40 years, uh, pretty much everything was wood. Right now, everything's pretty much a composite material, which is based on plastic, which is basically starting with a petroleum type product. Uh, so that's kind of the, the change that we've seen. And, and there has been, you know, as a fire service as a whole, that basically increase in that. Uh, and, and I think we're ahead of it. Uh, the good things we've done is we've got some policies in place uh, for guys when they go to fires to get their gear washed afterwards, uh, to get cleaned up and uh, some things that we could do within the budget uh, to make it a health and, and healthier and safety environment for them. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, please go ahead. So <clears throat> what you're saying is that although fires have decreased over time, the yes. toxicity of them have greatly increased? Yes. Yes, it's, it's basically like I said, you know, you know, we go back 30, 40 years, uh, you know, wood was a main component of basically the building features in there. Uh, but I just say to everyone, think about what's in your living room, uh, your couches, you know, your chairs, your tables, uh, probably very few of them are actually a, a full wood product that they're pretty much a composite material, uh, which when they burn, they, they give off toxic fumes. Um. Switching to um, <clears throat> another malady, that of addiction, uh, I wonder, could you explain the spending of your department or review it with us? Um, the spending that you might spend on Narcan, the spending you might spend on the personnel side in terms of responding to overdoses in the city of Northampton. See, uh, the, there has the been a change. Absolutely. Uh, the Narcan that we use, basically, uh, they, they give it through basically an IV. 
Uh, I know the police department carries single doses, but what we have is we give it through basically a, an IV. So we exchange that at the hospital. So right now we're, we're not incurring any cost where all our meds for the ambulances basically come out of Cooley Dickinson. Uh, they don't give us much on the EMS supplies, but mm -hmm. basically mm -hmm. I think on the, on the positive side is, is all our uh, medications, our narcotics for the ambulances, they exchange one for one for us. And, uh, and, and so that's a good thing. So we're, we're spending really no money at all on Narcan. And, and the responses on that, uh, the police department probably has better, feet, uh, better uh, figures on the opiate overdoses. We track everything as a, as a whole. <coughs> they go to an overdose, which may be prescription pills, uh, and we just categorize all that there. Uh, but we are seeing the, the trend uh, within our figures, uh, as they've seen across the state, of an increase in, in the overdoses out there. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. O other questions? Well, we appreciate, again, your, your time spending your, your uh, re reviewing your budget with us. So thank you, Chief. Thank you. Thank you very much. And as the Chief <coughs> sits down, I'll ask if there's members of the public who'd like to <coughs> provide any comment or ask any questions during this public hearing? Uh, hearing none. Okay. Uh, any On any subject, please, would you like to? Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to address the name thing. Yeah. I'm Blair Gemma and I live at 3 Clark Avenue. Um, so you each get paid $9,000, except you, Councillor Donnell. So now I know you ran for president for the extra 1000 right? You get $10,000. Um, and you know, while you're all here and the mayor is here, I just want to advocate for you to get a higher salary. Um, I know you work hard, and I think you should get paid more um, because the city councilor salary is a class issue. Um, how exactly is someone who works full time but doesn't make that much money able to run for city council? I know a number of people um, that are considering running, but they scratch their head and they say, how would I actually be able to do this? Um, and I wonder, how do you do it? Um, I know you're working other jobs and care work for your family that unfortunately goes unpaid. But pensions and health care, um, these are benefits that aren't offered to many young workers and increasingly all workers in general. Um, and wouldn't those be great voices to have on the local city government council? Um, and this sentiment um, is really well articulately expressed um, in the poem I want a dyke for president. Feel free to Google that and check it out. Um, but this is something I would be interested in. Um, you know, how many hours of work do you work a week, and what does your hourly pay look like if you took your salary and divided it by your hours? And when was your last wage increase? Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, are there other members of the public who'd like to speak? Uh, I'd like to shift now to Central Services. Um, our Director of Central Services is, is not present with us because of, a, of an excuse that is certainly very understandable. I'd like to invite the Mayor, if he wants, to um, maybe give an overview of the salient points about the Central Services budget. So the, um, again, I apologize, uh, Director Pomerantz uh, was uh, ill this afternoon suddenly, so wasn't able, to, um, wasn't able to be here. So I can certainly talk about our Central Services Department, which as many of you know, um, is our, um, our facilities department that oversees our facilities. Um, and uh, it, we actually are unique in that we do have a combined uh, facilities oversight uh, department for both um, the city of Northampton and the Northampton Public Schools. Um, so uh, Mr. Pomerantz uh, works with a school, uh, both the school side, which includes 
it's maintenance of schools and school custodians as well as on the city side with our maintenance staff um, and our staff of uh, things like electricians and working on um, the other maintenance items for for our various city facilities um, that department also oversees um, uh, like our utilities our electrical our, our, um, our going out to bid for um, those sorts of items as well um, in terms of looking at the central services budget overall in in terms of um, in terms of this year's uh, budget I'm just trying to get to it here because uh, this was our um, you'll notice that uh, that budget is going up um, uh, overall there's a change in it of 5.6 percent um, part of that is uh, the fact that we are we're actually going to have um, Susan Wrights uh, come up as well because I want to have her speak to some of these issues as well. I'll just get over to the right narrative here. Um, so you'll see that uh, it covers the custodians, it covers the director himself, the principal clerk, our energy officer. Um, you can see that there's also some shared. Uh, if you look over to the right hand side you'll see some of the shared uh, resources that are funded by the Northampton Public Schools uh, 50 percent for example of Pat McCarthy who's the project coordinator um, does work uh, for schools and the city uh, so he's sort of partially paid by uh, by um, Northampton Public Schools um, Going down the line, you'll see electricity, street lights, natural gas. These are sort of all of the larger items that we fund all of our city side um, departments for. Um, tr things like trash removal, which is primarily located um, in, the d in the downtown area. Um, and then even things like paying the overall telephone bill uh, for the city, um, for all of the various city um, uh, buildings and departments, that all comes out of a centralized uh, central services budget. Um, in terms of uh, staffing, uh, there is a 0.52% increase, um, which is essentially the custodian um, uh, Mr. Arnold mentioned the wonderful facility we have here for um, the Aquatic Center at uh, Smith Vote. Um, it's been a long-standing um, challenge uh, to, between the city and the school department to have a custodian um, that could be on duty to take care of the Aquatic Center, which means overseeing the operations of the um, filtration system and all of that. And we sort of tried different models over time um, as to how to manage that, trying to have um, a, a, a school custodian managed that. Um, it actually came up in actually the override several years ago, uh, where that was an item that we helped fund part of the city, uh, part of the school's portion of that. We've decided to add uh, a 0.52 FTE custodian um, to be able to really just have stability in that. Um, and actually have a position that's not just a two, it's really hard to find somebody who will work on Saturdays and Sundays every weekend, um, like every weekend. Uh, and so um, what we want to do is try to incorporate it into our, into our custodial um, uh, you know, rotation and, and add a, a more fuller position so it's a five-day position with some rotation there um, because we, what we're finding is a high amount of turnover in that position and we want to keep it staffed so that we can keep the aquatic center um, functioning and staffed not only the aquatic center but also a lot of the um, youth and adult programs that happen here in the gymnasium at JFK on the weekends as well so that's what that increase in that small increase in a 0.52 FTE um, is to actually take a custodian that's part-time and add some additional um, hours to see if we can create some stability there so that's really the major um, staffing change I'm trying to remember Susan were there some other um, structural changes that we were making with utilities and uh, any of those other items in this budget uh, street lights aren't uh, are reflected this year they weren't last year um, no, streetlights were in the budget last year. Uh, they've they've been in the budget. Um, you know, but most most of the OM increases are just increases in um, contractual services, contractual inspection services. You know, we have the elevators inspected, fire extinguishers inspected, those kinds of services, elevators, etc. Mm -hmm. And then the other increases are in repair of buildings and grounds. Um, 
you know, we have a lot of stuff that isn't necessarily rise to the level of the capital plan. It's not a, you know, ten thousand or twenty thousand dollar repair, but stuff breaks. So we are trying to continue to make that a more robust budget so that we're not coming to you and doing transfers from free cash to fix things because we want to be able to fix things immediately rather than waiting a month or two. So we're trying to build up the um, amount of money that um, Central Services has at their disposal to do repairs on a regular basis. On the, on the contract side, one of the things um, in working with our partnership with Forbes Library, for example, trying to work with them to find cost savings. So one of the things this year is um, they used to go out to, they used to have their own separate elevator contract for their elevators. Um, and so one of the things we extended to them was let's add your elevator to our elevator contract because we can get a better price because we're, we have a contract with all of, you know, all the various elevators in the schools and city hall, et cetera. Um, so again, we're, you know, you may see a slight increase in that um, contract, but it's to try to create cost savings and obviously to give Forbes more research, resources to focus on library services. Um, so there's some things like that. We've done something similar with Lilly as well uh, to assist them um, and some other economies of scale uh, like that. Um, I did want to mention, you know, definitely the, the energy savings. We are starting to see some of that now, um, both with, um, you know, the, the uh, landfill uh, project. You know, we're not actually um, generating electricity that's going to the schools to power the schools, but what we're doing is we're assigning the savings um, that we're benefiting from as part of the power purchase agreement that we have as part of the lease, um, which one of the things, you know, the, the Amoresco gets the SREX credits and gets that whole piece of it. What we see is a decrease in our energy bills. Um, and so what we basically do are assigning that savings to different um, city buildings. So, you know, Dr. Provost mentioned the savings they're now starting to see in um, in their energy bills, and that's a direct result of us being able to assign those, um, the savings that we've benefited from all of our work in renewable energy. So, you know, we talk a lot about renewable energy, and obviously we, we, we want to strive to get to 100% renewable, um, but it has a real cost in terms, it has a real benefit in terms of our fiscal sustainability, as well as our, you know, environmental sustainability, because it's allowing us to, uh, to be able to spend more on those uh, uh, student service issues that we are seeing increases in as opposed to paying for um, increased you know fossil fuel uh, in terms of how we heat our schools great other questions so I, I, I that was a sort of totally unrehearsed yeah. coverage of the central services budget because I didn't come here prepared to do that but uh, that's sounded I'll good try to answer questions Councillor Klein so your last point about the uh, sustainability and, and savings um, relates exactly to the question. The reason I called out um, something about the streetlights yeah. is I wanted to look at, you know, sitting on the Sustainability um, Energy and Sustainability Commission, I know that we've gone through this process of um, replacing all of our streetlights. So I wanted to look at the difference in the budget from uh, last year. Mm -hmm. I have it right here. So. I can't actually find in last year's budget streetlights, but it's the second thing under OM um, in this year's budget. So I don't have that comparison, but I do see that we're budgeting more for electricity this year than we did last year. And I'm wondering why, if we're starting to see some savings, but also I'd really like to know the difference in the budget in terms of the streetlights. We have something called signal lights, which I think is yeah, that's different more than last year's? Uh, signal lights, it, last year is now street lights because it was never signal lights. Yeah. So we changed okay, it. So that's it, it. It was under this uh, code that was like a munis code that we called signal lights, which I think also had like the street light signals as well, possibly. So into last it. year we, yep. we budgeted $85,000 for the signal light street lights. Mm -hmm. And this year, 101,000. So I'm curious about the increase there, but also in the um, budget for electricity for municipal buildings. So the higher. 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 So the street lights, um, the street lights we put in over a year and a half ago. It has taken National Grid almost a year to start giving us the new rates, and then. We are only just starting to get bills for the streetlights at the new rates. 
they have to go back and credit us from the moment that the street lights were installed. So they have been doing adjustments to all of the bills and National Grid is been very confused and we have been going back and forth That's with generous. them. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, we've been going back and forth with them. So we have just started to see some of the credits coming in from the, you know, from the whole year that we had the LED street lights in. So it was difficult, it's difficult for us to get a handle on exactly what our new bills are going to be for street lights because we haven't had a year's worth of history. That's one reason we basically level funded them. The number that was used last year was, is much lower than we actually spent on streetlights because that last year when we did the budget, we thought we'd have the streetlights in and we'd have the new rates. So last year's number was already less than what we've really been spending. What we added to this year's number is about $18,000 because under the agreement, the streetlights are now ours and we have to do the maintenance on those streetlights. So in the end, we are, we are saving money on the streetlights. We are saving significant money, but we have yet to have it register within the whole budget. And it's hard to take savings to the bank until you actually know what they are. And, so. and, and, and again, on last year's budget, you may remember that we had to come forward for a transfer um, because the streetlight process took a little longer than we expected. Some of you may remember we delayed it to do some additional testing and then the fact that the tariff issue hadn't been resolved. So I think we ended up doing a transfer to that. We did. We to that OM budget because we had thought, okay, we're, we're gonna start, we're gonna get this project done, we're gonna start seeing the savings. The project took longer and then the, um, the whole tariff issue. And um, again, uh, National Grid uh, was sort of late to the LED streetlight game. Um, uh, well, it used to be Western Mass, now it's Eversource, had, had switched over and done this whole tariff system many, many years ago. Um, and so many of the communities around us, you know, did their retrofits years ago. National Grid was sort of late to the game. Um, and I think that they have not, and I've ex expressed this to their, their senior management, that they haven't really adequately staffed up their, the, the resources they need to be able to do all this complicated billing and changing of reassigning um, streetlights to the, to the proper billing amount that needs to happen. And we've got, it's obviously a significant number of streetlights. So it's, it's taken us longer, so we're ended up waiting for all these credits. Um, so, so that's why it's level funded this year. We hope there'll be savings. And we hope that we'll have a, a, a year plus of experience and we'll be able to actually show what those, that savings actually is. But the, but the level funding is what we thought we would be spending after LED streetlights. If I recall, I think we spend over 150 in actuality. Um, but again, we're going to get these credits for tomorrow Just night. Just to clarify, it's a $15,000 in this year's budget. Right, and that was the uh, maintenance, the streetlight maintenance. Um, I think it was 15 to 18, I can't remember. But for tomorrow night, if Chris Mason is in tomorrow, I can get some more data from him on where we are with the, mm -hmm. with the whole street light situation. And can you address the question about the electricity, the $10,000 difference, the increase in this year's budget for I, electricity? I'm going to have to check yeah. with David Pomerantz, but I believe it's because we may be in a new contract by then. Our contract does not, for electricity, doesn't run on fiscal years. We often do that like in 18 months. Installments, yeah. so I need to check with him about about that. So yeah, we'll we'll try to get those answers for you. For just tomorrow. in terms of the the operation of the solar that we've added, you know, why we still have that increase. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Very good. Any well, other? I, I will say that one of the reasons is we assigned much of the credits we assigned to school buildings, sort of first. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd have to also look at how many we've assigned. The save, how much of that savings we've assigned to city side buildings. My first priority was to get the school, because obviously the schools are largest uh, pieces of infrastructure. So I know we've assigned a lot of those credits to the school. So that may be reflecting why they're seeing savings and we're not seeing it so much on the overall city side. But we'll, we'll try to get that number clarified for you for tomorrow. Anything else on that subject? Any other questions from the council about the operating budget for central services? Um, okay, if not, thank you, Mayor. Uh, one final call for a comment from any members of the public tonight. Okay, 
Um, again, my intention is to carry this hearing over until tomorrow night when the council meets at 7 p.m. in the city council chambers on Main Street. And so unless there's anything else tonight, Councillor. Yeah, if, if, if we've got questions for departments other than these five or more generalized revenue questions, would, would you prefer that we address those tomorrow night? Well, certainly if you have questions that you want information to come back to us by tomorrow, then you should either ask tonight or uh, ask the mayor's office as soon as possible so the information can be assembled, I would think. But I, it's not, I didn't ask department heads to come right. tomorrow. Right. Yeah. So some, some questions in an email, so, so sure. a heads up, would, would that be the, the, the best way to do it? That'd be fine, yeah. Okay. Yep. Great. The earlier yeah. in the day, the better, obviously, or yep. Yeah. Night or, yeah. Yep, yep. Anything else from the council? Okay, uh, do I hear a motion to continue the public hearing to tomorrow night? So a motion. Second. Okay. Made and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, abstention. So the hearing is continued. Is there any new business tonight? Is there a motion to adjourn? Is there a second? All those. And who seconded? I'll second. Seconded. Damn it. Good. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Good. Thank you.